as per the app. Yes, so thank you very much again for joining us. We are now going to start with today's session an approach to a person failing a protease inhibitor based regimen. I am going to switch off my video so that we do not use a lot of bandwidth. Um, this is the HIV masterclass. So today's session, it's a, a, I want to outline a practical approach to a patient whom you are going to see tomorrow. I'm not saying patients are going to fail, but based on the kinds of calls I get on a daily basis, the kinds of WhatsApp messages I have to respond to, I know that this is seemingly a bit common nowadays, and you have to have the confidence in terms of how you approach these groups of patients. Um, our next uh, session after next week, we will look at the patients who are failing Dolitegrave or integrase inhibitors. So please, let's focus just on this group of patients. <clears throat> just to say that um, it is rare for a patient to fail a protease inhibitor regimen within the first two years you know, of starting ART. As you can see, the majority of patients, they might get you know, some mutations. These are likely to be minor mutations if there's poor adherence earlier on. But after 20 to 24 months, right, you start to get significant uh, major mutations developing. Hence, you would see even later on when we talk about the criteria as you evaluate these patients, we always want to encourage that you become patient, you at least monitor and evaluate your patients over a course of two years. And if your patient fails to suppress or to resuppress during this period, you may then consider that your patient has already failed. And this is data from South Africa. And uh, <clears throat> KZN is an important province in this context because the, 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 the biggest pie of the patients who are on ARVs um, in excess of 1 million patients are living in the KwaZulu-Natal province. This uh, slide is meant to remind us that when you have 100 patients taking a protease inhibitor and they present with a high viral load, the majority of these patients would not be failing, right? Only about 16, you know, in a 100 patients would have developed at least one key and important mutation against your protease inhibitors. So more than half the time when a patient presents with a high viral load on a protease inhibitor regimen, it is best to deal with underlying causes, whether it's poor adherence, um, side effects that your patients might be experiencing, drug-drug interactions, malabsorption of the drugs, you know, and, and so on. However, if these patients were taking other drugs like your NRTIs or your NNRTIs, the majority would be failing. And this sort of confirms that we are talking about protease inhibitors, um, drugs that have a high barrier to resistance, you know, and are unlikely to fail easily, even in the context of a patient who is uh, adhering poorly. So these drugs are a little bit more forgiving than our traditional NNRTIs looking at efavirenz <coughs> and neverapine. Remember that for resistance to develop, it's actually a multifactorial um, kind of uh, um, um, challenge, which is determined by the fitness of the virus. And generally, if you look at our second line um, regimen where patients are going to be on lamivudin, remember if you keep your patients on lamivudin, you are maintaining uh, this uh, particular mutation, the M184V, which reduces the fitness of the virus or the ability <clears throat> of the virus to replicate very fast. So most of the patients who are taking second line on a PI-based regimen would have a virus that is less fit compared to the wild type or a virus that does not have uh, mutations. And the same mutation will increase susceptibility to a drug like uh, zidovudine. So, so remember viral fitness plays a part you know, genetic barrier to resistance. So what type of ARVs is your patient taking? Today, I dealt with a pregnant woman who's on uh, nevirapine uh, for the last uh, two, three years. 
she has never suppressed on that particular regimen and she was to, uh, uh, just above 20 weeks pregnant you know so i didn't look back i said well we are dealing with a very weak art regimen we need to switch uh, that so that also plays you know um, a role and then the potency of these drugs and as you will see when you compare different drugs <clears throat> by how potent you know their ability to deal um, with the drug and suppress the virus significantly uh, versus you know the, the their strength in terms of preventing uh, mutations or resistance you would see that our protease inhibitors, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, juranavir, ritonavir, uh, come up tops. So these are sort of the drugs of choice where you have a virus that has a lot of mutations because these drugs are very potent and they have a strong genetic barrier um, to resistance. And this is just the intro, trying to set the tone around when we say PI mutations, what are we talking about? And really, these are very rare uh, to find. And even when they do happen, um, these drugs are still very active and um, effective um, right there. Again, genetic barrier to resistance, you would see that if your protease inhibitors, lopinavir, ritonavir, juranavir, ritonavir, or atazanavir with ritonavir, if you are dealing with boosted, when you say boosted, we mean these uh, combinations have ritonavir as part of the formulation, you would need three to eight, you know, major mutations um, to render high level resistance um, to these drugs. So these drugs are regarded as a, a, a class that has a high genetic barrier to resistance. Just uh, remember as well that if they are unboosted, uh, particularly in the context where these drugs are given with TB drugs, rifampicin, um, which is a liver enzyme um, inducer. Um, if you do not super boost or prescribe additional retonavir or even double the dose, you would reduce their genetic uh, uh, barrier to almost nothing, right? So this is quite important. Hence, in my own clinical experience, whenever I'm presented with a child who's failing a protease inhibitor, Whenever I ask about the history and you check uh, the old prescriptions, you always find that the child was on TB treatment and that super boosting <clears throat> to counter the effect of rifampicin was not done or was forgotten, which is an iatrogenic cause of uh, resistance and treatment failure. So this is quite um, crucial um, and important. So this is just uh, to remind you of the HIV life cycle and where we are operating today. You know, we've got the, you know, your, your drugs uh, that generally block entry of the virus into our immune cell. So this would be the virus there. I'm not going to the detail like the first session, just the highlights, <laughs> right? And uh, <clears throat> once you've got attachment and the fusion of the membranes, the viral genome is released into the cytoplasm. You've got reverse transcription where the viral RNA is transcribed into a viral DNA, um, which is facilitated by reverse transcriptase, right? I'm not going to the details, so please don't have a headache yet. <laughs> I'm just doing highlights. <clears throat> now, so there's reverse transcription. This is where we are, where RNA is converted to DNA. Once you have the viral DNA, it is transported into the host nucleus, which is our nucleus there. The steps that follow is your integration. So the integration of the viral code into our own um, DNA there. And we say integration has happened, facilitated by an enzyme called integrase. So when we talk about integrase inhibitors, they would block the integration of the viral DNA into the host DNA. Once uh, HIV has captured uh, our DNA, um, there's going to be transcription of this particular DNA. It will be translated you know, from M, uh, messenger RNA to specific uh, 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 amino acids, which would then form specific proteins that would then form the structure you know, of the virion or a baby um, virus. As part of forming this particular uh, virus during formation, there's these long strands um, of uh, polyprotein um, chains 
that need to be cleaved or cut, you know, by an enzyme called protease. So remember protease there, because that's what I wanted you to be aware of. You know, so we've got drugs that are called protease inhibitors and the lopinavir, ritonavir, or atazanavir with ritonavir, or juranave with ritonave. Those are the three, really. There's many others in dinave and so on, but these are the top three, really, that are being used in today's world that you need to know about. So these particular drugs, they work by interrupting the function of protease so that these uh, virions or baby viruses are not formed. And if they are formed, they fail to mature uh, so that they do not go back and start the cycle and infect, you know, um, more cells. So we talk about protease in, in inhibitors, inhibiting protease um, at that level. So I'm hoping um, you're following. So these are your protease inhibitors. This is where they work. And today we are discussing a patient whom you see who has a high viral load. And when you check the regimen, the drug that the patient is taking, He's taking protease inhibitors. The commonest, the 99.9% .9 of patients you are going to see with a high viral load on a protease inhibitors would be uh, taking lopinavir with ritonavir, and, and uh, we need to evaluate them, right? So yes, uh, so remember um, in this instance, whenever you are seeing a patient who's got a high viral load, Right, that means they have a virus that is replicating in the presence of the drugs. Uh, it's not an easy evaluation because there could be a number of factors that contribute towards that. There could be poor adherence, and usually, you know, underlying poor adherence in the South African context, it's a lot of social, you know, economic uh, issues, mental health issues, but also some some of the things related to the treatments that we prescribe. If your patient is experiencing a lot of side effects, particularly if they're taking a protease inhibitor, there's this watery diarrhea, you know, which people are not coping with. And eventually they stop um, taking these particular drugs. There is regimen issues because remember, your lopinavir, ritonavir is not a fixed dose combination. So they are moving from one tablet on the first line regimen to almost five tablets, uh, if you look at, no, six tablets actually, if, all in all, if you look at the second line, because if it's a combination tablet of Zidovudin, Lamivudin, that's two tablets, plus your two tablets BD of Lopina Veritonavir. So the pill burden is so huge such that some patients are not coping uh, with the new regimen. But as well, these drugs are prone to drug drug interactions. Like I have said, if your patient is taking anticonvulsants, is taking rifampicin or any drug that is a liver enzyme inducer, you know, rifapentin, you, you, these drugs would reduce your drug levels, allowing the virus to start to replicate, you know, rapid clearance, that is a, a fast tracking excretion or, or absorption, poor absorption. So your patient is actually, they are taking the drugs, but if you do your therapeutic drug levels, you would find low blood concentrations of the drugs, some host uh, genetics, wrong dose, so they are not taking the drugs correctly, or poor potency, as was the case uh, which was discussed with me today of a pregnant mom with high viral loads on neverapine. That is the weakest regimen, really, <laughs> that we have in this day and era. So all this would contribute to lowering drug levels allowing the virus to replicate in the presence of the drugs. And then the, the virus starts to develop changes or mutations. We say the patient has a resistant bug. However, a certain group of patients would be infected with a resistant um, a bug, either from their sexual partners or through the PMTCT program. Um, unfortunately, then we are dealing with a patient who has pre-treatment drug resistance uh, most of the time. Just as a reminder of some of the key mutations, because remember we are talking PI treatment failure, but we don't take uh, protease inhibitors alone. They are taken with NRTIs. 
And if your patient is on lamivudine or emtricitabine, these drugs would select for this particular mutation, M184V, right? You would see that it uh, delays the development of mutations against zidovudin. It increases susceptibility. So it's a preferred mutation. It's a mutation that we like because once this mutation develops, the virus uh, replicates slowly. You are likely to get mutations against zidovudin very quickly and, and uh, zidovudin would be more effective. So it's a preferred uh, mutation. You've got your thymidine analogs, right? So this is the, the cases we discussed uh, this week as well on the WhatsApp groups. And I kept on saying, yes, uh, you know, uh, you can give AZT in a certain group of patients, but you must take drug history because if you are dealing with a patient who was previously on Stavudin, yes, we don't use this drug anymore, but patients who were on ARVs before 2010, would have been exposed to stavudine. And if uh, this patient had failed, had high viral loads on stavudine and developed what we call your thymidine analog mutations, right? As soon as you put your patient on AZT, these mutations would reappear. Remember, HIV mutations never disappear, right? They get archived, they get stored. So you had a patient who was taking Stavudine and then later, and then he failed, let's say for argument's sake, then he was giving TDF. And today you have now to consider a regimen for this patient and you are thinking, yeah, let me give this patient a Zidovudine. It's likely that Zidovudine is compromised because your patient previously failed um, um, Stavudine. So when we talk about the importance of having one active NRTI in the context of DTG. These are some of the things that you have um, to consider. I know some of you would raise and uh, say, but there's new studies, yes, but if you read those publications in detail, you would see that even in those, uh, uh, Nadia too, there are patients who failed uh, DTG. And uh, with South Africa having five uh, to six million people on ARVs, uh, those small numbers in the studies can become big numbers uh, in South Africa. So our guidelines have not changed. Whenever you give dolutegra there, you have to consider whether this NRTI you are prescribing is compromised or not. If you do not have very active NRTIs, you should be prescribing uh, that NRTI with lopinavir. I'm hoping I'm not confusing you because I'm saying a lot of things, but I'm just trying to tell stories and I hope uh, you can follow as well, right? Um, these are mutations, uh, particularly again to your D drugs, you know, your DDI, D40 and AZT. Uh, another key mutation that you need to know, it's a signature mutation that patients develop when they are on turnoff of it. It's called a K65R. This is very important. That's why I'm starting here because Sometimes when we have to switch, like this week, there was a patient who was failing a TDF, but was anemic, you know, and then someone has said, but why don't we give a bakave, you know, but the, you give a bakave, remember if you fail TDF, you develop this signature mutation that would impact on a bakave, right? And most likely your patient already has M184V, that means a bakave as well would be affected, right? So if you have no choice and you have to give a bakave because your patient is anemic, rather give a bakave with lopinave and not necessarily with the DTG in the, in the South African guidelines, right? I know science out there tells us something else, but let's stick to what our current clinical guidance says until reviewed. So, so, so I'm just putting this so that you understand that uh, the switches and the playing with the drugs, you, you need to always ask about the drug history of your patient. When did you start? Which regimen were you taking? Why did they switch you at this time? Was it the side effect or was it because you had a high viral load? If it's a side effect, it's fine. That drug can be used again, depending on the type of side effect. But if it's a high viral load, you are cautious to say, if a patient, Five years ago, failed Stavudine, most likely they developed your thymidine analog mutations. 
And if we give AZT, AZT is already compromised. So therefore you are trying to formulate a good regimen uh, for your patient right there. Your NNRTIs, like I said, this is your uh, efavirenz and Neverapi. They are the weakest link. They are the weakest link in our first line um, regimen because they have a low barrier to resistance. Remember, they are very potent. So it's not a question of potency. It's a question of whether these drugs have a huge barrier such that they don't develop resistance easily. And unfortunately, these drugs have a weak barrier to resistance one single uh, point mutation K103N can render the class less effective, including some of your second generation um, NNRTIs. So these are drugs that are quite weak. And your protease inhibitors, like I said, you need at least seven to eight uh, mutations, you know, that accumulate in order for you to render this class uh, weak. Um, and these are some of the things that we will discuss um, um, shortly. Now, when should a resistance test be done? Uh, we're talking particularly for adults, and this is from our guidelines, right? Any patient failing a PI, that's why one scenario this week uh, was written this way, doctor, I have a patient, he's got a two viral loads that are high, can I switch? No, you can't switch. You can't switch if your patient is on a PI regimen. For you to switch from a PI regimen, a, a resistance test is required. So that is a mandate, it's mandatory. Uh, whenever you think this treatment failure from lopinavir, ritonavir, it has to be confirmed with a resistance test. Why? Because when I started the first two slides said, if a patient presents with a high viral load on a PI-based regimen, the, most of those patients are not failing. And uh, there was a case as well this week, multiple high viral loads, resistance test was done, it came back sensitive. I then replied and I said, yes, I see the viral loads, but your patient is not taking the drug because it's got high viral loads, the resistance test says there are no mutations. Uh, obviously it depends on how this test was done. If at the time when the test was done, the patient uh, had stopped, so maybe, you know, so those kind of things. So you can only stop PIs if you have consecutive viral loads that are high and you have a high level uh, a major mutations against lopina veritonal. Very important, right? Um, resistance testing as well should be done if a patient is failing DTG as part of second line. So if patients are failing DTG, high viral load on DTG, but it's a first line regimen, there is no indication for a resistance test, but that's not what we are talking about today, right? Any patient, right, who presents with a high viral load on lopinavir, ritonavir, and they received a, a TB treatment and we forgot to dose adjust or to increase the dose of lopinavir, a resistance test is, indicated and any patient who fails PrEP. So someone who has HIV negative on PrEP and they come back positive, you have to consider doing a resistance test. So those are the indications. This is important because when we do the case study shortly, uh, to interpret that genotype uh, test result, you have to know and understand this slide because a genotypic resistance test is not the, you know, the ultimate. It's got its own strengths and weaknesses. So let's look at the first bullet again. We say here, genotypic, geno, genotypic testing can be used to detect mutations that are causing resistance to on a current regimen. So if at the time when the test is done, your patient is taking tenofovir, Lamivudine and Lopinavir, Ritonavir. The test can only confirm mutations against those three drugs, right? Because if a patient was previously on Stavudine, it won't pick up those mutations unless there is drug pressure or your patient is put back on Stavudine or Zidovudine. So very, very, very key, right? It can also help to preserve treatment options by showing ineffective drugs. So it does not, a genotypic test is not supposed to tell us which drugs to use. It only tells us which drugs we shouldn't use, right? So if it comes back and says there's resistance against tenofovir, all that is telling us is that tenofovir for this patient 
is a no-go. It doesn't necessarily mean that AZT is safe because for you to evaluate whether AZT is a good drug for that patient or not, you have to check the drug history of your patient. And, and, and remember that at the time when you did the test, the patient was not on um, Zidovudine. So I'm hoping you are following there. What are the good things? Generally requires, uh, I mean, the negative things, it, it, it requires a detail, you know, the more, the higher the viral load, the easily, you know, uh, the test is going to pick up, you know, any mutations that are there. So if you are, if you're talking about a patient who's got a series of viral loads, 500, 600, you must interpret the results in that context. If you pick up mutations, you are happy. Yes, I've picked them up. But if you don't pick them up, it doesn't necessarily mean the mutations are not there, right? They can still be there. It's just that the viral load, it's very low uh, for your patient, right? It cannot detect low frequency mutations. So in a population of viruses, if the mutant virus is a minority, it is not the dominant virus. So it is less than 20% of the overall population. The test might miss um, that particular mutation. You know, and it, it it will not pick up stored or archived mutations. So if your patient was previously on efavirenz, they failed, and today they are taking lopinavir, ritonavir. You know, um, it might come back and say efavirenz sensitive. It does not mean sensitive, right? It probably means that the mutations are stored. If you say, yeah, it's a sensitive, let me give a five you'll be shocked that as soon as you give a five rents, K103 appears immediately because it was archived. It can only be selected for or expressed when the patient is taking that particular drug. Very, very, very key um, and important. And the, that statement, they're very important. Uh, a genotype test is better at determining which drugs won't work rather than which ones will. I always talk about the calls when someone calls and say, hey, here's a test results, which drugs can I give? I answer, say, hey, I don't know. Why don't you know? Because I don't know the patient. I don't know the drug history, the previous switches. All I know is that drug one, two, and three should not be used because there is high level resistance, right? So you have to take the history, the, your knowledge of mutations and the sequencing, you know, which mutations come first for you to determine the appropriate regimen uh, for your patient. All right. So that is the key. So, yeah, so, so, so please pay attention now. So, because I, I now want to introduce uh, uh, this scoring system. So, you, you would know about the, the Stanford database, you know, there's also uh, the one that is used uh, by the KZN guys in the country. You know, these are all uh, databases of mutations and they use some form of a scoring system, uh, you know, which informs um, an algorithm that is used to decide whether the, this drug should be used for this patient, you know, um, or not, right? So basically these scoring systems they are based on the presence of specific mutations. So if, for example, a mutation like M184V is detected, that mutation is given a penalty score against a specific drug, right? Obviously, M184V would render a drug like Lamivudin or m to be of high level or even intermediate, but most likely high level resistance, right? If you take blood from Dr. Mawela and this mutation M184V is detected, right? It, that would automatically score resistance against lamivudine and emtricitabine as high level. But using the same mutation and we say, what is the impact of that mutation on Abakave, for argument's sake, right? It might be an intermediate or even low level um, resistance. So basically the scoring system is simple, it's not complicated. The, the blood specimen is evaluated for mutations. 
mutations that are picked up have a particular score against all the drugs and then you are given a score so that's how it works so if your score is zero to nine it means no yes that the mutation is there but the drug is still very effective right if the mutation is between fifth the score is between 50 and 29 that is low level resistance and obviously from 30 going up we, we don't like uh, uh, these kind of scores because they render the drug ineffective against that particular um, 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 ARV drug. So please remember the scoring system and uh, you don't have to cram it because on the actual results, uh, the scores um, are given with the interpretation to say this is susceptible, low level resistance or even high level um, resistance. So that is quite key. So here's the, the, the scoring system for third line ART, which is used in the country, very important. We firstly look at your protease. Remember the indications for a resistance test, right? Patients who are not taking lopinavir, ritonavir, or a, a, a protease inhibitor shouldn't be getting a resistance test in the first place, right? But if your PI score, if the score against lopinavir, ritonavir, or other PIs, is uh, less than 15. Now, if I go back to less than 15, you see less than 15, that means uh, your protease inhibitors are still susceptible, right? There is no indication. There is no indication for any review of that regimen. We stop there, right? You can only proceed to discuss third line ART if your protease inhibitor or your lopinavir ritonavir score crosses uh, 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 15. And what do we mean? We mean from low level resistance to high level resistance, then we start to become worried. As soon as that has been picked up, your regimen has to change. And your next regimen would be a second generation protease inhibitor, which is Juranavir with Ritonavir. We always keep Lamivudin or Emtracitabine in the regimen. Why are we keeping it there? To maintain the mutation M184V because that mutation is beneficial, right? Then a choice between Zidovudin and Tenofovir. And really the choice here is determined most of the time by two things. One is the actual score. So for example, going back to the scoring, if for argument's sake, uh, uh, the score for Zidovudin is 15 and for TDF is 30, obviously we would choose Zidovudin, <laughs> right? Because Zidovudin is the most sensitive. So basically we compare the scores, the one with the lowest score, uh, we would choose between these two drugs, but also um, the, the, the clinical picture or, or, or side effects you know, from your patient. For example, if your patient has severe anemia, obviously we'll take TDF. If your patient has severe renal issues, uh, kidney, high creatinine uh, levels or low creatinine clearance, then we choose um, Zidovudin. So your entry regimen into third line is a combination of Zidovudin, Lamivudin with Juranavir uh, or Tenofovir, Lamivudin with um, Juranavir. So that is how um, we look at it there, right? Now, this decision to introduce these three drugs, it's based on just your PI score. Once your PI score, going back, your Lopinavir, Ritonavir score, crosses 15, automatically these three drugs are in, right? Now we look again to say, do we have significant uh, 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 resistance against TDF or AZT, right? So if you are giving AZT and the score for AZT is above 30, right? You therefore had to add dolutegravir um, in that particular regimen. Or if in addition to a high score for lopinavir, ritonavir, your patient had started to develop mutations against juranavir, even if they had not been on that drug before, um, we would then need to add dolutegravir. So your patient would now take four drugs, um, dolutegravir, tenofovir, lamivudin, and 
Jurana vein. Why? Because Lopina Vesco is high, or, or in addition to a high Jurana Vesco or a high TDF as a T score, your patient needs four drugs. I hope you are following. <laughs> Please do type there in the chat box and say, hey, doctor. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, uh tell me if uh, you you are you are okay are you guys okay are you struggling with network i see some of you um are struggling can i just see okay some of you are here yeah, all right yeah please do tell me if you are struggling right yes yeah i know there's network issues with uh, all the electricity problems we are having right so let me come back uh, to where i was you know yeah so, so I was saying to you, the entry point, the entry point into a third line regimen is whether your patient has uh, major mutations against lopinavir ritonavir. If the score for lopinavir ritonavir is less than 15, forget third line. Go and deal with adherence and side effects and whatever uh, issues <laughs> your patient uh, is having, right? If the score is higher than 15, then you have to prescribe a new regimen, which is a choice between Zidovudin, TDF plus Lamivudin and um, um, Juranabe with Retonabe. You further evaluate whether the resistance against either TDF or AZT was very high or, or there was also you know, some level of uh, uh, Juranabe mutations, right? If either of these two are positive, you have to add dolutegrave as a fourth drug, right, to that regimen. You'll see here they say raltragrave or dolutegrave. Uh, you know, these are both integrase inhibitors, but a number of studies which have been published have showed that dolutegrave is quite superior to raltragrave in terms of virological control for patients who need salvage um, therapies. So we rarely use raltagrave. We generally use dolutegrave with TDF, lamivudin, and juranave, right? You've, now, if you prescribe DTG, you must then further evaluate whether in addition uh, to high levels of um, resistance to TDF, uh, juranave, that there is also sensitivity to a travel. Remember here at this point, it was either or. So you have a patient who's, very, who's got a sensitivity to Juranave, but high levels uh, of resistance to either AZT or TDF, you need to add um, DTG. If your patient has both, so it's no longer or, it is an end, right? There is high level resistance against the TDF, AZT, plus high level resistance to Juranave, and there is still sensitivity to the second generation NNRTI, Eltraverin, you should add the fifth drug. So some patients, that's why when you look at third line drugs, right? Um, 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 some patients are taking three drugs, some patients are taking four drugs, some patients are taking five drugs. It all depends on their resistance uh, profile, uh, you know, um, which is uh, very important. And yes, uh, Tembela, you are saying, are we allowed? No, Tembela, I'm going to discuss it now, uh, but you should be able to, 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 to interpret and know what's happening. Unfortunately, these drugs are ordered on a named patient basis, particularly your ultra variants and your uh, Juranave, uh, right there, you won't get the drugs. These two drugs, you won't get them. They are ordered on a named patient basis. And to get them, you need to submit a form with all the drug history plus your copy of your uh, resistance test um, results. Then you are able to send it to the National Third Line Committee and then they evaluate. But I know in the, the people who are attending, we have people in the private sector, like in the mines, I know that they have their own committees. I know in KZN, Chief Albert Lutuli is doing the same. So also provinces differ. So there is a centralized committee at national, but provinces as well, where there is capacity, they have developed their own uh, referral processes, uh, but it's still centralized probably within 
a specialized unit in a in a in a particular province or, or district. So this is quite um, important, right? So these drugs which are listed here, you should know, you know, all of them. So we discussed tenofovir as part of your third line, 300 milligrams daily. We discussed zidovudine, uh, uh, which is part of your 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 third line as well, depending on the profile, but you'll see that the, if there's anemia or if there's kidney issues, you need to evaluate. We discussed DTG, which can be used as a fourth drug. So you have to review drug-drug interactions, very important. And we are talking about patients who present with a high viral load. Most of them would be taking a lopinavir um, 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 with ritonavir. Uh, as a regimen, as a second line um, regimen, right? Then I said, these two drugs, uh, Juranave, I didn't write the full names, I should have written the full names, but I think uh, I don't see the, 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 the yeah, Juranave, yes, the, the names are there at the bottom. So these two drugs, Juranave and Eltraverin. So Juranave is your second generation protease inhibitor, right? It's uh, more potent, uh, and better than lopinave or atazanave, you know. Um, and then you've got also your ultra ultraverin there, uh, which is a second generation NNRTI. So I know with your NNRTIs, you know efavirenz and uh, neverapine. So remember, there's others: relpivirin, I mean, ultraverin, delaverin, and so on. So these are the ones that you would need to use. And I thought I should summarize in this slide, you know, they are dosing. You'll see that ultra uh, varin, it's a, it's a 200 milligrams, a 12 hourly dose. When you prescribe it, it's like neverapine type, right? You always have to monitor for rash and uh, some jaundice or a hepatitis. And then you've got your Juranavir, uh, which is standard. It's a 600 over 100 as a 12 hourly dose but you can also give um, a daily dose, right? Only if there were no Juranavir mutations. So if on your, as we evaluate a Lopinavir, Ritonavir treatment failure, and there are no mutations against Juranavir, you can actually give it as a daily dose, which improves, you know, um, adherence, you know? But Juranavir, pay attention to patients who have uh, previous allergies to sulfur. So if someone had a, a Bactrim allergy, they are likely to have Juranavir allergy because Bactrim as well happens in patients who have a sulfur um, allergy. And you'll see uh, these side effects are not very common, but your GI upset, nausea, vomiting, rash, and then also high cholesterol um, levels. Um, these are quite... Um, uh, um, important there. Uh, is it my is it my network? All right. Let me see if I can uh, switch. I hope this doesn't disturb uh, the presentation because I see some of you have a blurry um, network. Can you comment there if you are all having the same problem? Then I will switch my network maybe to to a phone. Though, though I don't trust the phone that well. Hey, can you comment, guys? Are you able to see my slide? Uh, all right. Sometimes we are blurry. All right, so maybe it's my network. So let me try and do it this way. All right. Okay. There and El Traverin. Uh, can you confirm that it's clear? All right, it seems like uh, we are on the clear. Uh, not clear. All right. Yeah, I wonder.
let's get Kate. Kate, this is the history, and I'll tell you the history so that uh, 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 you don't get lost. I'm not here, but you can proceed. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Mm. Mm. All right, let me pause. All right, yeah, so let's discuss a case of Kate. So the story of Kate, uh, my background is more important than what is written on the slide, right? So, so Kate was seen for the first time um, when she had taken a TLD for a year, right? And then uh, with a, she had presented with a baseline CD4 count of 156 and her six months viral load um, was uh, suppressed, right? She had completed TB treatment the previous month and uh, the TB smear at the end of the treatment uh, was negative, right? So, so during that 12 months review, the repeat, the 12 months results, was a CD4 count of 148 and a viral load of 1,500 1, copies, right? which was slightly up. And this is what you are seeing here, right? And a, then a lot of adherence was done, you know, at 18 months, you can see the viral load there. At 24 months, the viral load went a little bit down, but now she had some level of immunological treatment failure. You can see there, the CD4 count dropping to 98. Remember the pre-treatment CD4 count was 156. And when we talk immunological treatment failure, we talk about a CD4 count that drops below the pre-treatment um, level there. So at 24 months there, a decision was taken because remember she was taking DTG and the first line DTG, we don't need to do any resistance testing. So a decision was taken at 24 months there, right? To switch her to this regimen, Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Lopinave, Ritonave, right? So you are reviewing her now at 30 months. Now this is six months after the switch to Zidovudin, Lamivudin, with Lopinave, and she's complaining of, hey, these tablets are too many, obviously, Lopinave, you know, moving from one tablet to second line, it's not a, a, a child's game, it's a lot of tablets. And then she does miss some doses, but she's stable and she has no infections, right? And your worry is that as you review her viral load six months after the switch, right? She, it has decreased, but it is not uh, fully suppressed. We are still looking at a viral load of 4,329. So I have a question for you. So when you evaluate her today, six months after the switch and the viral load is uh, 4,000, uh, which of these uh, options would be some of the things that you think need to be done? Okay, I'll give you about 30 seconds to, to, to decide. All right, I'm going 30 seconds already, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> And I'm going to show you what you opted for. So enhanced adherence counseling, very important because she she's reporting uh, missing several doses. She's complaining also about the number of tablets, but also her viral load is not suppressed, right? Switch to third line ART. Remember the golden rule before you can switch anyone to third line ART, which was a question by, I think it's Tembela you have to confirm that there are major mutations against lopinavir, ritonavir, and we don't have that. Now, conduct resistance test. I see 33% uh, said you must do a resistance test. But the challenge um, um, with that is that, remember, we have just switched the patient to lopinavir. 
since taking lopina bear we have only one high viral load so you know we we are not yet there continue current regimen yes i agree repeat the viral load in six months time i probably agree it could be earlier but six months is fine on lopina bear so basically the three key options there are to provide enhanced utterance counseling continue this regimen uh, 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 you know, get treatment supporters, talk to the patient, assess mental health, substance use and abuse and see what's going on. Also check if you can simplify the regimen to minimize the number of tablets by using fixed dose combinations where possible. And then repeat the viral load um, um, in six months. I need to say that in terms of the pill bed, then remember there's now a fixed dose combination of atazanavir and ritonavir. And if you have access to that, it might be an option uh, for a patient like this one at this point in time, right? So yes, I'm going to continue. So <clears throat> fortunately or unfortunately, and I think it's Tembela again who shared, I can't remember, I might be wrong, uh, who shared a result similar to this, a, a real patient result of a patient who's got high viral loads uh, but if you now this is the resistance test right you can see the history that the patient was previously on tdf um, tricitabine efavirenz zidovudine labivudine lopinavir ritonavir let's start with the first one zidovudine you see zidovudine there is m184v remember this mutation is fine but it does not affect zidovudine that much and then you've got some thymine analogs t215s and there is a potential low level resistance. The score is 10. Remember that scoring um, that we spoke about, right? Um, which is quite um, key. Again, Lamivudin M184V. Remember I said this mutation would render Lamivudin and Emtricitabine, right? It would render Lamivudin and Emtricitabine high level um, resistance, right? So basically, we've got potential low level resistance and we've got low level resistance for Abacave. But look at your protease, your, your, your protease inhibitor there. Lopinavir, Ritonavir is susceptible, right? What does this tell you? If you have a patient who's got high viral loads on Lopinavir, Ritonavir, but the resistance test says susceptible, right? This tells you that the patient is not taking the drug. But this particular patient, we already knew, she told us that I, I, miss, I miss taking the drug sometimes and the tablets are too much. I want to show you a few things as well, which is very important. Look at the uh, TDF. Remember when we said, when you look at the resistance uh, test, it only tells you which drugs not to use. So you can see we've got high level mutation against lamivudine and emtricitabine. In a, another world, we wouldn't use these two, but because we know that this mutation here benefits us in that it impairs the replication of the virus, we will still continue to keep these drugs um, in the regimen. Now it says here, tenofovir susceptible, efavirenz susceptible. Do you see them, these two? Does it mean you can use um, um, these drugs, right? The answer is no, you can't use um, um, these two drugs because you, you have to evaluate the previous history. And if in the previous uh, history, there's a history that the patient failed um, tenofovir, the patient could still have a K65R mutation, which is stored or archived. Right. So that's why we say a resistance test will always tell you which drugs not to use, but susceptibility is not equal to use the drug. Right. You have to check the drug history um, of your patient. So this is uh, quite important. My apologies for those uh, who are struggling with my slides being blurry. I think uh, I might have a network issue with ESCOM and everyone. But let's see if uh, you can follow still, right? So coming back to our patient, for us to assess, for us to assess whether this patient uh, uh, is eligible for third line at this point in time, the first thing to check is the PI score. 
So let's go back to the Lopina V Ritona V score. So there is Lopina V Ritona V, and the score for Lopina V Ritona V is zero. <laughs> so the score is not more than 15. The score is less than 15. Therefore, we are not even going to proceed. It stops there. This patient has a high viral load, complaints of adherence, and a high number of tablets. The resistance test, which was not supposed to be done, by the way, this is quite wasteful, right? Uh, but it was done. It confirms that uh, this, uh, the, the sensitivity to lopina there, and therefore uh, we are not going to proceed. You have to deal with adherence issues, deal with whatever issues your patient is experiencing. Simplify the regimen, you know, get the treatment supporter, see your patient very frequently, and repeat the viral load again. Um, in six months time. So I hope you, you know how to manage a patient who presents with a high viral load on a PI uh, where there's just adherence issues, right? Deal with those issues. Uh, don't waste a lot of um, resources. So this is that slide and really it's a repeat just reminding you that when you interpret a genotype test, it's important that you understand that a genotype test will never tell you which drugs to use. It will not detect uh, mutations that are stored. It will only tell you about mutations against the regimen, the drugs that the patient was taking at the time when the test was done. So that is quite uh, crucial. Uh, I keep on repeating it, but I hope uh, you got it uh, right there, right? So let's come back to Kate. So here we are. Hey, it's your turn now, you know? So remember, we last saw her at 30 months and the viral load was 4,000. We did a viral load at that point in time. And the, I mean, we did a resistance test, which was not indicated, but it was done, right? And it came back and says sensitive to your protease inhibitors. Now we are at 36 months, 36 months, her, her, what you call her viral load is still up. It's not suppressed. Actually, it's going up again. It's 13,000. And look at her CD4 count, right? It's now even worse uh, than the time when we switched her from your, your DTG there. She now complains of oral source. You know, she attended the clinic. So for these six months, she was a good patient. She was taking her treatment as prescribed. You assess her as still stable but she now has oral candida, right? She is still on Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Lopinave, and Ritonave. There is a question for you there. What do you think is uh, happening here? What are the potential things uh, that are happening at this point in time? What's your take? Hmm. Interesting. Okay, a few more seconds. Welcome, Ahmed. I see you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop now so that we can have a quick discussion. So biological treatment failure. Yeah, I mean, it's a suspicion. We didn't say what is the diagnosis. So it's still a suspicion that there is biological failure because the viral load is not uh, improving. Immunological treatment failure, yes. Why? Because the CD4 count has dropped significantly and it is below the pre-treatment um, level. Clinical treatment failure, who remembers what that definition is? The definition of treatment failure happens if a patient develops an AIDS-defining condition or uh, a stage four, a WHO stage four condition after taking ARVs uh, for at least um, six months. So if we look at our patient, yes, he has taken ARVs for at least um, six months, but then there is a question there which says, uh, what is the clinical stage of our patient? Do we think he has developed a stage four condition? Uh, we will evaluate um, this particular question uh, and then this poor adherence. So maybe it's all of the above or just the first a two plus a poor adherence. We will evaluate um, that question um, shortly. So yeah, so there's, there's the another question. So what is the WHO clinical stage for Kate? <laughs> yes, what is the stage? 
What do you think is uh, Kate's uh, stage? Uh -huh. mm. All right, I see. I'm going to stop now and then show you. Uh, most of you said stage three, and then there's two and four and some one. <laughs> what is the correct stage? Okay, remember uh, the clinical care platform, we have a basic HIV management course. Please don't undermine that course because I see most of you, you like the advanced course. You know, doing the advanced course uh, without doing the basic course, I it doesn't work because uh, staging is covered there and it's very important. So oral candida, remember the patient has oral candida. It's a WHO stage three condition. It becomes stage four if she's got difficulty in swallowing. So we, where we suspect oropharyngeal or even os osophageal candida, you know. So stage one, patients don't have any sores at all. Stage two, They've got angular chelitis. So it's a candida limited to the corners of the mouth. Stage three, it's in the mouth, the tongue, the heart palate. Stage four, it's in the pharynx or oesophagus. So please remember that. So it's a stage three condition, right? It was just a quick test to check there. Plus, but please do do the basic course uh, so that, uh, yeah. So, so we are saying uh, 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 the patient, uh, is suspected to have virological treatment failure. Yes, the patient has immunological treatment failure. And then lastly, the patient has deteriorated. Yes, the patient has clinically deteriorated from being asymptomatic to being WHO stage three, though that is not an AIDS defining condition. The patient is not yet stage four. So what is your plan at this point in time? What do you want us to do next? Uh, for this patient. Thanks, uh, 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 Jabuladi. Stage three, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, few more seconds. <laughs> you are selecting everything. How is that? <laughs> All right. All right. You guys are just selecting everything. All right. With adherence, you can never go wrong. Resistance testing. Yeah. So what are the indications here for resistance testing? One that I can think of is immunological treatment failure. Remember, we say if a patient is taking a protease inhibitor, lopina veritona, you need at least three viral loads taken over two years, right? In terms of lopina ve, it's only a year, uh, yeah, six months, six months. It's only a year since the patient is on lopina ve. However, the patient is clinically deteriorating from being asymptomatic to now becoming sick and the uh, Im severe immunological um, 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 treatment failure there, the CD4 count is 49. That is an indication to proceed and do a resistance test, even if the patient has not achieved the full 24 months, uh, particularly on lopinavir. Remember the first 24 months he was on it, she was on a DTG-based regimen, and then now on a lopinavir. So yeah, resistance test, I agree. You can't refer at this point, right? Because the third line committee will not see any patient who does not have the results. So in terms of where we are now, we have to do the test. We will continue the current regimen, uh, do adherence. And our decision is going to be based on the resistance test results. I hope uh, you are following me and uh, you are not getting lost, right? So I'm going to stop with the questions and then let's look at it nicely. So this is where we are. We are saying if the viral load is suppressed, we are happy. If it's between 50 and 1,000, we are worried. If it's more than 1,000, we are very worried and we need to deal with that. If it's more than 1,000 and your patient is taking a protease inhibitor, right? Yes, uh, I see. Apologies if network issues. 
Um, if it's if your viral load is more than a thousand and your patient is on a protease inhibitor based regimen, adherence is very important. You need to repeat the viral load at least three times over a course um, of uh, two years. Um, assess for clinical and immunological failure, right? A new stage three, stage four condition or a drop in the CD4 count. Now, this third bullet here is the key indication on our side that we are dealing with a patient who's, who needs to get a resistance test. Even if we have the patient has not been on lopinavir, ritonavir uh, for 24 months. So that is quite important. So you would do your adherence assessment, A, B, C, D, E. Is our patient adherent, you know, missing um, doses, lack of support, alcohol abuse, uh, mental health assessment? Does he have infections that we need to treat? Yes, that candida needs to be treated. Is he taking the drugs correctly? Does he take other medicines that may interfere with the ARVs? And is an, a resistance test indicated? And the answer is yes, a resistance test is indicated because the patient is clinically and immunologically um, deteriorating. That is very important. And this is where we are. This is a, from the guidelines now. It says if a patient is taking a second line regimen, like in our case, the patient is taking Zidovudin, Lamivudin with a, a Lopinavir, Ritonavir. You see the, this regimen here, a resistance test is required. So we have to do, you cannot switch from a protease inhibitor based regimen without confirming a high level or major resistance against your protease inhibitor. And if you do confirm it, you must refer your patient to a third line committee to evaluate so that the patient can get the right drugs. Here is what you've been waiting for. You ordered it. Look at it nicely and slowly. <laughs> now it is totally different from the one we saw earlier. Right, I don't know if you remember. It is totally different. So now we've got more thymidine analog mutations. And now this reminds us of what? If a patient has a high viral load and the viral load is, uh, I mean, the virus is allowed to replicate in the presence of the drug, the patient will get more and more mutations. They accumulate. That's why you shouldn't be keeping patients longer than they should on a failing regimen, right? So we've got more thymidine analogs, and then you still have the M184V, right? Look at the scores there. Your lamivudin, high level resistance, sorry, Brawalta, and then the m bean, high level resistance, and the abacave intermediate with zidovudin almost out. Tenofove seems like it's still uh, active, but what is your concern about TDF is that at the time when the test was done, the patient was not on TDF. So we can still have archived mutations, right? Very, very, very um, important. Nah? And then lopinavir, which is our point of interest, the high level resistance. So what is the difference between the first test, which was sensitive, and the second test, which is high level. On the first test, your patient was not, at the time when the test was done, your patient had stopped lopinavir. Very keen eh, to follow. Now you did adherence, the patient comes back, says I've never missed a dose, I'm taking it. You repeat the test, now the mutations appear, right? It's a very important rule that uh, you should take into account that if your patient has stopped taking the drugs, don't do the resistance test. Deal with adherence first, then do the test so that the test can pick up um, these mutations. Pay attention that the other uh, protease inhibitors are now also affected, including the key drug that we want to use as part of the third line. There's already a score. I think it should be zero, but we are already looking at five, though five is still susceptible. If this patient is continued on a lopinavir-based regimen without intervention, she will, she will accumulate more and more mutations 
uh, weakening the third line regimen drugs even before she's exposed to those drugs. So that is quite um, key. So this is where we are, right? Uh, the PI score uh, is more than 15, therefore we prescribe this regimen. TDF, now if we have to choose between TDF and Zidovudin, TDF makes sense because TDF had a score of, can't remember, 15, right? Zidovudin has a very bad score. So we use TDF, but remember, uh, TDF might be benefiting because K65R might be archived. So you have to use that drug history and decide very carefully. Though in this case scenario, TDF was a choice with Lamivudin and Juranave. So these three drugs are prescribed for this patient, but then we must evaluate, do we, does TDF have a score more than 30? No, right? Does Juranave have a score more than 15? No, therefore, we stop there. We are not going to add Dolutegrave. I need you to be aware that if for whatever reason you decide to give Zidovudin, remember Zidovudin had a score of 55. Just remember that. So if we decided, let's say the patient had renal issues and we can't give TDF and we decide to give Zidovudin, Lamivudin with Jurana Vet, when you come to this box, AZT would have had a score of above 30 because it was, because the actual score is 55, right? Therefore, if you give AZT, you must add DTG. Very, very, very important um, um, to note um, 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 this one. So, so very, very, very key. I hope uh, you are seeing it. I, I like it. <laughs> I like it. So I hope, uh, 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 yes, uh, thanks, Kleba. We will discuss those issues. So again, this is from the HIV Clinician Society. You can see that their recommendation clearly is to say that a third line, the best third line uh, to give uh, to our patients is TD, it's actually to just give TLD with Jurana V, right? But uh, you know, this is here, they are trying to come up with a programmatic approach to say, can we have, you know, the same way that we are able to switch from first line to second line. Is it possible to have a, a very simple third line um, regimen? You know, it's possible, but there's things to pay attention to. You have to make sure that you've got a good adherence program. Know that the final regimen should be based on the drug history and the resistance test. So you can't just switch to third line. It, otherwise, you will cause a lot of harm. Also, whether your patient is anemic, has anemia or renal disease, it, it interferes with whether TDF or AZT or Abacave, right, which is uh, very important. Also, with, if Juranave has a score of zero, you can use a, 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 a daily um, 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 dosing rather than a 12-hourly a um, dosing. I've already explained that DTG is better than um, Raltagrave. Right, but if your patient has some resistance to DTG, you might need to give it twice daily rather than the daily dose, um, which is standard. So that's why this thing requires a commit. You can see as I continue with the slide, it just gets more complex, right? But the thing is, have an approach, monitor your patient, repeat viral loads, do your resistance test. If you have high level mutation, to lopina veritonave, complete the forms, refer to the third line committee, then your patient gets the drugs. When the drugs come back, they would have either additional drugs, uh, juranave or ultraverin with DTG, and you monitor your patient uh, 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 from that. So, so Rofio, you are asking why four drugs uh, when TDF, mm, I said four drugs, Rufiwa, four drugs if you choose Zidovudin, right? So for TDF is three drugs. It's a TDF, Lamivudin, Juranave, Ritonave, uh, right? And then if you chose Zidovudin, it's four drugs. But with this table is from the guidelines from the Phoenician Society. Uh, they are recommending a standard third line regimen. But even with their recommendation to say, 
if all your third line regiments could be these four drugs, you also have to consider these five bullets. And if you consider these five bullets, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of movements. And that's why I'm saying it becomes more complex. And I don't want to get into it that much. I want to summarize your role in this whole process by saying your role is to assess, monitor patients who have high viral loads, uh, evaluate them for clinical and immunological treatment failure. If they have these two things before 24 months, do the resistance test. If the test comes back with high level resistance to lopina, they refer to the, to the, to the third line uh, committee. You know, that is your, your, your key role. When, the, when the, the feedback from the committee, when it comes back, you will be able to make sense because you will look at the resistance and the drug history, you look at the drugs and you'll remember the algorithm uh, that I have just showed you. It's a bit complex if you consider all these bullets, but I think you should be able to, 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 to figure it out. As I close, I want to say a few things, right? If you look at here, they were looking at patients who are failing second line in South Africa and they're looking at you know, mu uh, 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 um, um, mutations, and this is quite recent, 2021, and you would see that most, because the major, right, orange represents major, you will see that most patients on second line, very key, most patients taking second line therapy with a high viral load have major mutations against NRTIs and your NNRTIs, and some of them PIs, but the majority on PIs have no mutations at all. This is, or they've got minor uh, uh, mutations, right? So this is very important. I repeat it again. Patients with a high viral load on a PI-based regimen, the majority are not failing. They've got adherence um, issues. That is the key message. This one, is, it's, it's very loaded. Uh, uh, this one, I will share the, the article and it's also recent and it's from the uh, UKZN, you know, the KZN guys are really doing uh, extra work. So they look at drug resistance levels for patients with a major protease inhibitor. The key message, which I want to tell you, don't keep patients who are failing. You know, you can see here in KZN, high level resistance, the dark blue against lopinavir, you can see it was very high. Yes, okay, so then very, very high, even at Hazanave. But what do you see, which is very important for you to note? We are starting to see patients who are failing second line, who now, for the first time when they are evaluated, they already present with major mutations against Juranave, right? That is very important because it tells us that now our third line drugs are becoming compromised. Look at Eltraverin there, very significant uh, uh, mutation. So please, yes, we talk about this two year, you know, uh, waiting time, repeating viral loads. Don't delay patients beyond that because the, if you delay them beyond that, they start to accumulate mutations, which would render our third line drugs ineffective before patients are even uh, uh, exposed to that, right? Um, you know, so a third of people with a high viral load on, uh, I mean, with the receiving PIs already have a major protease inhibitor. This is from KZN, right? Last year's uh, report, this one, right? Early genotype is important because patients are now presenting with extensive PI resistance. That means they are now presenting, they are failing Lopinave, but when you evaluate them, they've already failed Juranave, and that is going to put us in trouble because we don't have a fourth line. There's no fourth line <laughs> regimen. This slide is very complex. When I send you the slide, look at it very carefully, but all that is, this slide is showing us is that depending on whether your third line regimen includes uh, drugs that the patient were on or even newer drugs on the red side there, the suppression rates, the suppression rates, this is the only message from this slide, that patients who are taking third line have a difficulty in suppressing the virus, right? So some ARVs is better than no ARVs, but this uh, choice, this salvage, these four or five drugs, 
that particular virus is a very difficult virus to suppress. We rarely get suppression rates of up to 100% because we are dealing with very complex um, viruses, right? So third line ART regimen in the public sector, even in private, you can use this uh, 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 email, TLR, it means third line art at health.gov.za, TL, third line art at health.gov.za. Uh, uh, this is the form, uh, I'll find the electronic proper form and, and share it. We just complete the patient's name, the drug history, what was started, stopped when, with a copy of your resistance. Remember, if there is no high-level mutations to lopino don't even bother. <laughs> ZD, the third line committee will not evaluate patients who have no high level resistance uh, uh, to, to Lopida very All right. So, <laughs> this was today. I hope uh, it was not too heavy on you, but uh, I hope I've also managed to raise uh, some of the key uh, important things around patients failing uh, PIs. 